from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. It ended in the disaster that we saw at Kabul Airport. Hundreds of Americans left behind, well over a thousand Americans left behind, tens of thousands of Afghan allies left behind, and 13 Americans killed and dozens wounded in in that devastating ISIS-K terrorist attack. This is your host, Scott Bertram, and that's Jerry Dunleavy, co-author of the new book, Kabul, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. We'll talk with Jerry and his co-author, James Hassan, a little later on in today's program for an in-depth interview on the book. First, we're joined by Dr. Adam Carrington, Associate Professor of Politics and William and Patricia Lamoth Chair in the U.S. Constitution at Hillsdale College. Dr. Carrington, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Thanks for having me again. Continuing our conversations on the U.S. Supreme Court's most recent term and some of the decisions handed down during that time. This one not near the end of the term, but a little bit earlier, Sackett v. EPA. And this concerns one of my favorite terms because it has been discussed nearly nonstop the past decade or so. We we know about FLOTUS and we know about SCOTUS, but WOTUS, Waters of the United States. Where has the controversy come in in the interpretation of this term, Waters of the United States? It comes from the Clean Water Act, which is one of the major environmental policies of the last 50 plus years. And it gives the national government and particularly the EPA power, regulatory power over what are considered waters of the United States. So then one must ask when one sees a particular body of water, however big or small, whatever its other contours, whatever its other properties, is this a water of the United States? So one can determine, does it fall within the regulatory power of the EPA, of Congress, given the, the the Clean Water Act. And so, yes, you're right. For 50 years, we've been debating, is that a water of the United States? Is that a water <laughs> of the United States? Uh, uh, what is it? <laughs> Justice Samuel Alito writes the lead opinion in this case. What does he say? How does he how does he define this phrase? And how does he come to the to that point? I mean, again, we've been debating what it means. So how does Justice Alito get to the place where he ultimately decides what this means? Right. So so he says some of the obvious. It's not a puddle after a rainstorm, right? That it, it's a permanent body of water. The other is that it is in some way direct, either is a navigable part of interstate waters, interstate commerce that you could you know, float a boat on to do commerce and trade between states, because that's really the basis for Congress's power mm-hmm. over this, is that these waters are... Uh, to be kept clean, to be channels of commerce between the states, or it is something that is directly connected to it. So in this case, we were talking about wetlands. So the wetlands themselves maybe might not be navigable, but are they directly connected to these waters? And so that's defending, one, the size of the water, two, is it part of a, a national chain of waters that are part of interstate commerce. And Mm -hmm. that's how he defended. Those are some of the criteria that you have to be looking for. What does he base that on? Let's go back to the original meaning of how it was written. Where is he getting sort of his his legal backing for how he's going to, and and, and the majority, is going to define that term? Yeah. So one is waters of the United States. And so the idea there is if it's a national law of the United States is seeing something that is more national in scope. Mm -hmm. Two, it is often laws like these are often defended, again, like I said, on the interstate commerce clause. Where does the Congress get the power to do something in relation to water bodies when a lot of these regulations are usually left to the states? And the argument is, well, it can have these health and safety regulations for the water because it is regulating the commerce that occurs on them. And then the the, the way he gets that it can be the, those waters plus what's attached to them is that there are terms of uh, in the text of that the Clean Water Act itself that talks about being adjacent to 
waters that are adjacent to or waters that are interconnected with. So that's where he gets the particular textual idea for, for, for what these are. And this is then another case from this most recent Roberts Court in which it is offering a restraint on governmental power and specifically in this case, federal power. Absolutely. And there's really two relationships that it's talking about restraints on. And one is the relationship of the government in general to the individual. It's saying for government to act against you, they have to point to a reasonable, good interpretation of a law passed by the people's representatives. Mm -hmm. And this is saying what Alito is saying is agencies, bureaucrats have played a little fast and loose with the text of the Clean Water Act in such a way that they have expanded and done more to individuals, regulated them more, fined them more, changed their lives more than the laws themselves permitted. So there was that protection. But you're right. Even these wetlands could be regulated if they're not to be regulated by the Clean Water Act. They're regulatable by the states. Mm -hmm. We've had such a expansion of national governmental power vis-a-vis the states. This is an attempt, I think, by the court to pare back the expanse of the national government and therefore to preserve the benefits of federalism, the benefits of having more power in the states to do the goods that the Constitution intended them to do as well. Is this also another case in which the court is essentially telling Congress, hey, if you mean this to mean that, write it that way. Be specific. Pass a law that says exactly what you want it to say. Right. And this is one where you can look at it positively as a con- ongoing refining conversation mm-hmm. between the legislative and judicial branch. The legislative branch passes a law. Sometimes when you pass a law, text doesn't necessarily operate the way you meant it to. People don't read it the way you intended. Sometimes that's their fault, but sometimes it's your fault. Maybe you could have written it and didn't anticipate how it would be understood. And so the courts interpret and apply the law. And if they do so in a way that Congress didn't really intend, Congress can come back, pass an amendment, pass a clarification that further states, no, this is what we really wanted done. Or or now that you've interpreted this way, we now see we want it done in a different way. Mm-hmm. And that kind of conversation can actually make for better laws in the end by the refining process that goes between them. Talking with Dr. Adam Carrington about the Sackett v. EPA case from the most recent Supreme Court term. Uh, this is a case in which it was unanimous in part and split in another part, I believe 5-4. What were the differences there between those two opinions? So it was 9 nothing on the outcome, which was that the Sacketts, we, we, we haven't talked a whole lot about them, but they wanted to build a house on, near a lake And it was considered wetlands, and they were told by the EPA they couldn't do the work they needed to do to make it present, be able to have a house built on it. And so all nine justices said the Clean Water Act does not apply to their instance. This is not a water of the United States. But 5-4, what was the standard? Which, of course, matters for all cases going forward. Sure. And so we, I talked a bit about Alito's standard. Kavanaugh, interestingly, led the four dissenting justices, the three Democratic appointees plus Kavanaugh. And his main opinion said there's one more allowance that this law has, and that's not just what not just waters that are connected to a interstate stream, an interstate river, interstate ocean, interstate whatever. It's also adjacent ones. So there may be ones that are, you know, there, there, there was a dam built in between them mm-hmm. or there was a natural bridge or something. And what Kavanaugh was trying to take seriously was the idea that it does mention adjacent waters, not just connected waters. And so he said to take adjacent seriously, it can't adjacent can't just be conflated with connected. So that that's the essence of it. That would give the EPA more regulatory power. But again, I would emphasize in our very split, acrimonious times, including on the court, this was a nine nothing decision on at least what the outcome of this particular litigation should be. Sometimes in discussing these cases, we 
overlook the actual people involved, the actual issue at hand. Judge the Parr's new book, if you haven't read it, does a good job of reminding people of the narratives and the people behind the Supreme Court cases. So in this case, what does this decision actually mean for the Sacketts, the plaintiffs in this case? Right. I said they were wanting to build a house by a lake. They've been trying for 15 years to do that. So a lot of, I won't say water under the bridge, but (laughs) I guess I did. But um, the case was actually remanded, meaning it was sent down to the lower court to be re-decided based on what the court said here. Mm -hmm. Almost for sure, though, based on the reasoning, based on the vote, the final decision will be for the Sacketts. So hopefully that means they get to finally maybe build this house that they've been wanting to build for, for, for a while. I don't see any other reasonable, foreseeable outcome based on the way that this, this, this decision was handed down. Dr. Adam Carrington, Associate Professor of Politics, William and Patricia Lamoth, Chair in the U.S. Constitution at Hillsdale College. Thanks for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you. Up next, Jerry Dunleavy and James Hassan join us with the inside story on Kabul, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Available now, renowned psychologist Jordan Peterson joins Hillsdale College President Larry Arn on the latest episode of The Larry Arn Show. Predict the future for me a little bit. It seems to me things are coming to a point. Do you think so? Yeah, well, I think things have always been coming to a point, but they're coming to a point way faster. Well, we have Moore's Law, right? Computing power doubles every 18 months. It's like, no, no, you don't understand. Computing power doubles every 18 months. We're now at the point in, in the course of technological progress where those doublings are happening multiple times within the span of a single life. And that means the ancient archetypal battles are accelerating. Listen to this exclusive interview with Jordan Peterson right now. Only available on The Larry Arn Show. Find it on the Hillsdale College Podcast Network at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. And subscribe to receive new episodes delivered right to your device. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out podcast.hillsdale.edu for the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. Hear older episodes of this program, plus others like Hillsdale Dialogues, the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, and Imprimus, all at podcast.hillsdale.edu. We're joined now by Jerry Dunleavy and James Hassan. They are the authors of the new book, Cobble, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. Jerry is an investigative reporter. He worked for the Washington Examiner for about half a decade. You see him frequently on Fox News and C-SPAN. James, a former Army captain, graduate of the U.S. Army Rangers School. You also have seen him in various places like Tucker Carlson Tonight, Fox and Friends and elsewhere. And again, the new book, Cobble, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. It's a wonderful book, and as you read, you feel like you are really there. The details told are incredible. We'll walk through some of the stories that you tell through our conversation today. The theme of the book, the main idea is is stated early, that what happened in Kabul was not inevitable. It was not a product of good faith decisions poorly executed. It was caused solely by the Biden administration's toxic combination of ignorance and self-assurance. And you argue earlier that Biden's refusal to keep U.S. promises to foreign allies was deliberate and emotion-driven. Take us inside, if you would, this decision-making process by President Biden and how we ended up sort of leading up to this chaos in Kabul. So we describe in our book how, at the end of the day, this was a policy that was driven solely by President Biden. This was his decision and his choice. Uh, A very early White House meeting that he had, 
right after being inaugurated, the question that he asked was, how quickly can we get out? And that is what his focus was. His focus was getting out quickly. His focus was not, how do we make sure we get Americans out? How do we make sure we get our Afghan allies out? How do we make sure that when we pull these U.S. troops in rapid fashion, we also do something to make sure that the Afghan military can stay on the battlefield and keep fighting the Taliban? Because keep in mind, when pulling U.S. troops, that also meant pulling U.S. logistics and ISR and advisors and contractors, which were all things that the United States had built the Afghan military around. And President Biden's decision meant pulling all of those things along with U.S. troops. And it just set an already very weak and shaky Afghan military. It just set it up for failure. Um, And failure is exactly what happened. And so this was being driven by President Biden. He was being warned by his military advisors and by his generals that if he did this, it would be a disaster. But he ignored them because this is what he wanted. Um, And he was oblivious, perhaps, but I think willfully blind to the reality on the ground. He just didn't care. This was the decision that he made. And he forced the people under him to execute it. And it ended in the disaster that we saw at Kabul airport. Hundreds of Americans left behind, well over a thousand Americans left behind, tens of thousands of Afghan allies left behind, and 13 Americans killed and dozens wounded in, in that devastating ISIS-K terrorist attack. Two big factors in the chaos in Kabul. One was the decision to abandon uh, Bagram Air Force Base. And one was the size of the Afghan security force was far smaller than reported. We were told, and the administration said 300,000 or so, but the size was far less than that. Those two factors, what role did they play, the decision and the size of the Afghan security force, in what we saw unfold? Well, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that we touch on in Kabul um, a good bit. And for the, with regards to the uh, size of the Afghan security forces, the administration, and to include General Milley, continually pushed this, this 300,000 number. And in fact, President Biden himself said, uh, you know, their the Afghan military is as well equipped as any military in the world and, and cited that, that figure. But as we show in Kabul, that nothing could have been further from the truth. Uh, it was well known that there were what are called ghost units, which essentially were just Afghan military units that existed only on paper. Uh, and, uh, you know, someone would collect the, the money that, you know, would go to pay for those, you know, so-called soldiers' salaries. And, um, but then also they inflated that figure by a significant proportion by counting Afghan local police, Afghan border police, and other kind of paramilitary style units. It, it would, you know, it'd be like saying that the, the U.S. military is eight million strong because we're counting a, a police force from Peoria, Illinois. It, it makes absolutely no sense. But that's, uh, that, that's what they use to try to sell the, the withdrawal to the American people. And, and it was, it was well known and it's well documented. But uh, it, basically, they, they just didn't want to play it straight with the American people because, as Jerry mentioned just a few seconds ago, um, there there was a political agenda to just get out as fast as possible, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, consequences be damned. Talking with Jerry Dunleavy and James Hassan, the book Cobble, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. You argue in in Cobble that the State Department, the administration, the White House never did the very basic things to ensure that Americans and Afghan allies would get out. What could they have done, and why did they fail to make those just very basic steps? Well, you mentioned uh, Bagram, and Bagram plays into this quite a bit, actually, because Bagram Air Base is pretty close to Kabul, and it would have been a much, much safer place to attempt to do a large-scale evacuation, the kind that we knew that we needed to do. Because 
keep in mind, we, we knew that there were thousands of Americans in Afghanistan. We knew that there were tens of thousands of Afghan allies, interpreters and the like, who had served alongside us over the two-decade war. And we knew that we had made promises to those people. But the Biden administration never came up with a plan about how to get those Americans and how to get those tens of thousands of Afghan allies out. And when it comes to Bagram, everybody knew that Bagram would be a much safer and more effective place to run an evacuation out of rather than a small airport in Kabul. And of course, doing the evacuation in, in out of Kabul airport became extremely foolish once the Taliban took over the entire country. But if we maintain Bagram, it would have been safer. There would have been standoff distance. Bagram is defensible. We never would have seen those chaotic scenes that we saw. On top of that, on top of maintaining Bagram being a much smarter place to do an evacuation from, inside Bagram were prisons which held some of the most high-value prisoners in all of Afghanistan, thousands of members of ISIS-K, dozens of members of al-Qaeda, and thousands of Taliban fighters were in prison at Bagram, including the bomber, whose name is Abdul Rahman Alagari. The Biden administration doesn't want to say his name, but that's his name. He is the bomber who carried out the Abbey Gate terrorist attack. He was in Bagram. We, had, we in coordination with Indian intelligence, had captured him back in 2017 when he attempted to carry out a suicide attack in India. And he had been in prison at Bagram. And he was in prison in Bagram in July 2021 when the United States abandoned Bagram. And he was still in prison until the Taliban took Bagram. And the first thing that the Taliban did when they took Bagram was they opened those doors and they freed those those thousands of prisoners, including thousands of members of ISIS-K and that suicide bomber. And so the simple fact is that not only was abandoning Bagram extremely foolish when it came to conducting the evacuation that we knew we would need to do, the simple fact is that if we had simply held on to Bagram, thousands of ISIS-K terrorists, including the guy who carried out the Abbey Gate attack, instead of them being out there threatening Americans, and instead of Ligari successfully killing Americans, all of those guys would have just been sitting behind bars. Jerry Dunleavy and James Hassan with us. Kabul is the new book, The Untold Story of Biden's Fiasco and the American Warriors Who Fought to the End. We race through the uh, the prelude. You'll, you'll want to read it in the book. But we get to the actual uh, attempt at the evacuation and the, uh, the attempts to, to clear Bagram and, and the area there. You tell us in, in detail the, the frustration that Everyone in the White House is on vacation as Kabul falls. The embassy evacuation, you take us through step by step how chaotic that was. There are a couple of details here that I I was not aware of previously. So I want you to tell us these stories. One is the CIA deal with the Afghan National Strike Unit to clear the runways for the evacuations. How did that come to pass? Why was it so successful? And then how did it affect later American evacuation efforts? So the National Strike Units, they're also called uh, Zero Units or you know, different different acronyms, are, uh, there were CIA-controlled Afghan paramilitary units. And we had some based in Kabul, some based in the, the border provinces um, of Afghanistan and Pakistan, like Coast Province. And uh, they, were, they were highly trained very, very brutal, uh, but very proficient. And when the uh, the airports got flooded with those now you know, infamous scenes of people hanging on to planes and you know flooding the runways, there were only at the time several hundred or six hundred American troops on the ground. And to put that in context, there were essentially uh, one soldier for every four diplomats in the country at the time. So, so there was absolutely no way that the um, you know, small amount of manpower that the Biden administration left in the country against the wishes of, of the military leaders who wanted a whole lot more for, for what are now very obvious reasons. So there was no way that that small amount of, of manpower could clear the crowds or you know, essentially just even protect 
the basic functioning of the airport. And so at that point, the CIA stepped in and made a deal with these these strike units uh, who were uh, otherwise likely not going to be you know, taken as part of the evacuation. And the, the deal was just a very straightforward quid pro quo. If you guys clear the airport and help us maintain security, then we will get you and all of your family members out. And the, uh, you know, the, the, the NSU units are very, very good at one thing, and that is being completely brutal and, and effective, for better or for worse. And so they, uh, they immediately got to work, you know, using their vehicles, driving the, the crowds off the airfield. They were, they were butt stroking, uh, people who weren't complying, firing warning shots just past people's heads. And, and so they were able to, to clear the airfield and kind of help uh, set kind of, you know, some conditions where we could then try to actually have some kind of evacuation. And that the 82nd Airborne and uh, Marine units that were coming in as reinforcements could land because otherwise, uh, without that, reinforcements never would have landed because mm-hmm. the, the runways were just too flooded. But the you know the second half of that, you know, the, the devil's in the details. Now we had 30,000 more people that we had to evacuate. And that it, already we were stretched to the limits. Uh, and that, that really sort of pushed everything over the top. And at that point, that, that led to activating the, the civil air relief, which is when the U.S. government uses commercial aircraft to help uh, evacuate personnel from from dangerous location or from follow-on location and uh ultimately it it led to a situation where we didn't get as many afghan allies as we wanted out uh the fiv holders like the interpreters uh, or the uh you know american citizens and all that i would add to that is is when you look at the 140,000 or so figure on, on the number of people that were airlifted out of Kabul. It's an impressive feat and it was, it was done because of the, what the soldiers on the ground were able to do. Sort of the, the American soldier at its best, but the American government at its worst. But when you look at those, those numbers and you start to actually break them down, you see that that SIV holders, those Afghan allies and interpreters that we had made promises to, they actually made up a, a a very small part of the number of people that we got out. In the midst of all this chaos, the White House and the president begins taking some criticism for the slow evacuation of Americans from Kabul and Afghanistan. And, and so President Biden issues a directive to increase the evacuee numbers. What's the consequences of that on the ground in Kabul? To- to provide a little bit of context, the, the administration was getting a, a lot of heat at those initial press conferences regarding the evacuation about the slow pace of evacuations and the low number of people that were getting out. And to try and essentially put a better face on the disaster that was happening and, and juice their numbers, the, the administration, and, and this, this was President Biden's decision, so this goes to President Biden himself, directed the military to essentially waive almost all of the requirements that we had for people that could enter the airfield. Previously, it was United States citizens and those FIV holders, meaning the uh, Afghan interpreters or other national security uh, personnel who worked alongside of us. So the result of that was that tens of thousands of individuals who were not just unvetted, but who had no connection to the U.S. government whatsoever, were admitted to the airfield. And it quickly overwhelmed all capacity that the uh, you know, the military had on the airfield. All of a sudden, they had you know, 10,000 plus individuals demanding to be let on planes and getting very angry when they couldn't be. And there were riots on the airfield and Basically, it ground everything to a halt, and the military had to actually shut down entry to the airfield for 36 hours. 
while they tried to get that under control and then get these personnel you know, out of the country. And military officers told the Pentagon investigators that this ultimately, uh, quote, set the stage for the attack on the 26th because all of a sudden now we're, you know, two days behind schedule in, in a situation where we are already uh, well behind schedule because the, the administration failed to plan. And we don't actually have any, you know, Americans or, or very few Americans and SIV holders uh, through the gates. And so if you fast forward to August 26th, when there was this very significant threat to the airfield, and, and we lay out in Kabul just kind of how clear that intelligence was and, and how uh, everyone kind of knew it was coming. The the administration was pressuring the military to keep the gates open because there were still thousands of Americans and thousands, or tens of thousands of Afghan allies that hadn't gotten through. So, uh, it, you know, it, the administration tries to say, um, and, and John Kirby actually just said this a couple of days ago, that nothing could have prevented the the Abbey Gate attacks from occurring. And there are a lot of different reasons why that's false, and we lay out some of those, and, and I'll let Jerry get to, you know, kind of further in the interview. But th- this is just kind of the first you know, step that really set the conditions for the attack, and it was completely designed or completely intended just to create a talking point for uh, the administration. And, and you see that over and over where they say, oh, well, we evacuated over 100,000 people. It was the biggest airlift in history. It might have been big in terms of numbers, but it, it certainly wasn't successful. So, guys, amid all this chaos and the thousands of Americans and others who still want to evacuate, why is the Biden administration and the U.S. so tied to that uh, August 31st deadline? Why not take another few days or another week or whatever it takes to finish the job? Part of it, you explain, in Kabul is is put upon the administration by themselves. They, they said, we have to abide by the state. But the Taliban also enters into this conversation too, right? Yeah. I mean, President Biden, because of his terrible decision-making, put us in a position where all that the United States controlled was that tiny airfield. The Taliban controlled everything else in Afghanistan. And we were relying on the Taliban to provide security outside of the airport. This was obviously a a terrible and dangerous situation that we had put ourselves in. And and as we lay out in the book Kabul, I, I encourage people to read it because the Marines and other service members talked about what they saw, the Taliban turning Americans away, sometimes beating Americans, the Taliban blocking our Afghan allies from getting to the airport, beating Afghans, even executing Afghans in full view of the Marines and in the Marine sniper tower, being able to see the the Taliban committing atrocities. And because of the rules of engagement, not being allowed to forcibly intervene to stop the Taliban from doing what it was doing. And this, this deal that we reached with the Taliban at Kabul airport, you know, the Taliban was oftentimes deciding who got in, who got out, the Taliban would sometimes allow the, cur- the crowds to surge forward, which would grind everything to a halt. The Taliban would sometimes stop people from be- being able to get through when we were trying to get Americans and our Afghan allies through. And this reliance on the Taliban also uh, plays out further. <laughs> Marine Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews, he testified to Congress about how he had He and the other Marines had been receiving detailed warnings about an impending attack at Kabul airport, likely at Abbey Gate, and had also been receiving descriptions of the likely suicide bomber. He asked his commanding officer for permission to take the shot, and his commanding officer said that he didn't have authority to give Tyler permission to take that shot and that he didn't know who did. And so that that likely suicide bomber disappeared into the crowd. In the course of writing our book, we also found other testimony. In the course of the Pentagon 
carrying out its investigations into the Abbey Gate attack and into the botched airstrike on August 29th that killed Afghan civilians. One officer told investigators that U.S. intelligence knew that the Taliban was staging at a hotel two to three kilometers west of Kabul airport and that the, the U.S. military asked the Taliban to conduct an assault on that location. And of course, the Taliban never did. And we also found another officer who said that he had requested permission to conduct a strike against the nicest K location in Afghanistan before the Abbey Gate bombing, but that the strike was denied. And it looks like it was denied in part, according to this officer, because the strike was deemed infeasible by military leadership due to a negative response from the Taliban. And so when you combine all of that, the abandonment of Bagram and the Taliban freeing the suicide bomber, the uh, rules of engagement being so unclear that a Marine doesn't have the ability to take a shot at a likely suicide bomber. Hmm. And then the, the other things that we found about the apparent reliance on the Taliban, you just see that this attack at Abbey Gate, it didn't have to happen. Talking with Jerry Dunleavy and James Hassan, the book Cobble, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. We're running a little long, but I know we want to talk uh, about the 13. There's an entire chapter devoted to the 13 who died in, in the suicide bombing you, you just mentioned at, at Abbey Gate. I, I, I guess what I want to make sure we discuss is the portion of the 13 chapter in which the family members talk to you, or in some cases you are compiling accounts they've given elsewhere, about their interactions with President Biden. And almost to a T, the families say to you that President Biden actively disrespected them in the aftermath of Kabul. What happened and what did you hear from the families? During the course of writing the book, you know, I I had the honor and of, of talking to a good number of the Gold Star families. And then in my new role um, on the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, helping lead the Afghanistan withdrawal investigation, I've gotten to speak with the families even more. And the only disclaimer I have here is that I'm just talking as the author of the book, not as a congressional investigator. But, you know, the, the families, they all have very similar stories that, of course, as we all saw, President Biden continually checking his watch during the dignified transfer at Dover. Um, you know, the families thought that that was extremely disrespectful. And a lot of the families told us that when they met with Biden in private, he didn't really seem to know their individual service members' names. And he would continually bring up his son, Bo. Now, of course, the death of President Biden's son, Bo, is tragic. But, you know, he he died of brain cancer in 2015. He had served in Iraq years before, back in 2009. So Bo didn't die on the battlefield, and he hadn't died just a couple of days before, as these Gold Star families' children had. And a lot of these Gold Star families ultimately held President Biden responsible for the situation that their children had been put in. And, and another thing to keep in mind that, that these families raised quite a bit is that President Biden has yet to say the names of the 13 out loud. It was expected, I think, by many people that he might do it at his first State of the Union after the Abbey Gate attack, or perhaps he would do it at Memorial Day. Perhaps he'd do it the next Memorial Day. Perhaps he'd do it on the second anniversary of the Abbey Gate attack, but he just hasn't done it. And so the, the families do feel slighted by President Biden, I think rightly so. And they also want answers about how this attack was allowed to happen. And they want accountability because something to really keep in mind here is that after this debacle, 20 years of war with the Taliban back in charge, Americans left behind, Afghan allies left behind, and 13 service members killed and dozens of them wounded, some of them permanently, there's been no accountability. No one's been demoted. No one's been fired. No one's resigned. And so that's what the families want. They want answers. But I think even more than that, they want accountability. The book is out now, and there are far more stories, and it's as complete of an account as you can find. Cobble, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. Jerry Dunleavy, 
James Hassan, the authors. Jerry, James, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. It was our pleasure. Thanks Thanks for having us. Up next, Kelly Scott Franklin from Hillsdale's English Department is back for another great moment in the great books. This time we head inside Moby Dick. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Over the past 100 years, America has pursued an ambitious foreign policy directed by faceless bureaucrats. While some of those departures were justified, American foreign policy is shifting. What began as the attempt of a free people to protect themselves has become rule by those who seek to impose their ideals around the globe. But how did we get here? In Hillsdale College's new free online course, American Foreign Policy, Michael Anton has the answers. Anton is a lecturer in politics at Hillsdale College, who served at the National Security Council during both the George W. Bush and Donald Trump administrations, and he'll be your guide through the history of American foreign policy. Learn about the Founders' vision of foreign policy and how progressivism and empire have eroded those principles. To enroll today and secure your spot in this completely free online course, visit hillsdale.edu slash new course, N-E-W-C-O-U-R-S-E. That's hillsdale.edu slash new course. We're back on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to follow the show on Facebook. Search for the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Get updated show and guest information. We're joined by Kelly Scott Franklin, Associate Professor of English at Hillsdale College. Dr. Franklin, thanks for joining us. Hi, Scott. I'm glad to be here. Back again for another great moment in the great books. We return to Moby Dick for the Sphinx. So people likely know the general shape of Moby Dick. Where are we in the novel here? What's the scene with the Sphinx? Yeah, we're, we're about halfway through the novel, more or less. And the crew of the Pequod has killed a sperm whale. And they, uh, as part of that process of rendering the whale down, they have decapitated the whale Uh, There's actually some some very valuable oil just in the sperm whale's head, the spermaceti oil. And they've hoisted this massive sperm whale head up on the side of the the Pequod. And the the Pequod is actually, it's so, the the head is so big and so heavy that the Pequod is actually like tilted over to the side. And later they're going to have to find, they're going to have to kill another whale just to cut off its head and balance the other side of the, so then the Pequod will be uh, upright again. But right now it's, it's canting over to one side and the crew has sort of done its work and then they're going to go, they're going to go take a break briefly and then they'll get back to work on the whale. And Captain Ahab is alone on the deck with this sperm whale head. And kind of classic Captain Ahab moment, he begins to talk to the dead whale head, mm. as as one does. Why does Melville title it the Sphinx? What's the Sphinx? The Sphinx is, um, according to classical mythology, uh, an infamous riddler. And that's really the first thing that the Sphinx, this whale head conce- for, for Captain Ahab conceals a riddle inside it somehow, or it, it has the answer to a riddle. And much of Captain Ahab's kind of dialogue, or I should say monologue, since it's a dead whale head, is about what something that is is, is deeply riddling to uh, to Captain Ahab. So that's the first thing. And second, one specific episode uh, with the Sphinx, and there are a couple different accounts of it. But Oedipus the King in in classical mythology and Sophocles writes about Oedipus the King. According to one account. Oedipus was able to solve the riddle of the Sphinx. And the, and there's different versions of this, this riddle, but the riddle goes something like this. What has one voice, but walks on uh, four legs in the morning, two legs at midday, and three legs in the evening. And so this is kind of the, the, the riddle. And if you don't get the riddle right, then the Sphinx kills you or eats you. And so according to you know the myths, Oedipus is able to solve this, and Sophocles writes about this. This he's saved the city of Thebes from the Sphinx. So this is going to be important because, as reader, as listeners uh, may already know, that this is a riddle about human beings, right? We we go on 
four legs. That is, we crawl when we when we're babies. We walk on two legs if we have two legs that work at midday. And then as we get older, we have a cane. That's our third leg. Mm -hmm. And Ahab does much of the scene leaning on a shovel. He he takes out the they have these shovels for digging the blubber off and various other things off the whale. And he he sort of shunks it into the carcass of the whale and then leans on it and melville says crutch wise uh -huh. so you have ahab who's often in various points in the novel ahab is often compared to oedipus the king or to various other kind of classical figures of tragedy and here he is enacting the last part of the riddle he's he's a man uh, you know he, he, a very robust man but you know late middle age or or perhaps in his 60s right he's leaning on this this crutch and of course, that's extra ironic since Ahab has already lost a leg to Moby Dick. So there's mm -hmm. these various, you know, prostheses in the novel. So that's that's the the kind of background there, that classical allusion. And and Melville wants us to see that there's going to be a riddle. It's not going to be that riddle. Ahab has a different riddle that he wants to solve. Can you read a bit? Can we hear some of Ahab's soliloquy from this portion of Moby Dick? It's it's truly amazing, and um, I think a lot in a lot of ways, Moby Dick really needs to be read aloud. Uh, I recognize that would take several days, probably, but it's when you read Melville aloud, you can hear that he was reading Shakespeare very, very carefully when he's writing the novel and right before he's writing the novel. There are times when this is a very Shakespearean soliloquy, uh, and there are even moments where it kind of uh, lapses into or slips into iambic pentameter. Hmm. So Melville writes, it was a black and hooded head and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm, it seemed the sphinxes in the desert. And then Ahab comes up to it. Speak, thou vast and venerable head, muttered Ahab, which though ungarnished with a beard, yet here and there lookest hoary with mosses. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers, thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations, where unrecorded names and navies rust and untold hopes and anchors rot. You can hear the iambic meter in there. Where in her murderous hold, this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned. There, in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where bell or diver never went, hast slept by many a sailor's side where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship, heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave, true to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck. For hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw, and his murderers still sailed on unharmed, while swift lightning shivered the neighboring ship that would have borne a righteous husband to outstretched longing arms. O oh, head, thou hast seed enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. I mean, I always tell my students, they, they don't make them like this anymore. <laughs> There's just, you're in the presence of greatness when you read passages like these. See, I think you should take the next 36 hours and just, just read for us. Uh, I, I think that sounds exhausting, but <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Dr. Kelly Scott Franklin with us as we talk about great moments in the great books. We're in Moby Dick and the Sphinx. So what is this all about and why is it a great moment in Moby Dick? Yeah, this this great moment is the moment where it, it is, I think, revealed what Ahab's deepest concern is. And that is uh, the problem of evil, the problem of pain, or, or as we might put it, why do bad things happen to innocent people? And he gives these examples, right? You've got the pirates who kill the captain or the mate and they throw him overboard and they sail away, no problem. And then lightning strikes some other ship that's carrying a righteous husband home to his family. He says, oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham. Abraham, uh, the father of our faith, whose, whose faith was credited to him as righteousness. He, Ahab says, if Abraham were to confront the problem of evil, the fact that things don't seem to be fair mm. in this life, mm -hmm. he would become an infidel. He would start to doubt. And that's 
Ahab is asking that question because he himself has suffered so gravely. He's, he's been struck by lightning. He's lost his leg. There's a suggestion in the book that when his ivory leg breaks right before the journey of the Pequod begins, that he's wounded in the groin and perhaps rendered impotent or infertile. And this is a man who has suffered so much in addition to the really like strenuous life of being a whaling captain, which sounds right. kind of awful uh, to me, <laughs> not my preferred career choice, but you know, I let people make their own decisions. That amount of suffering troubles Ahab. He, he, he wants to know why, why me? Why has this happened to me? And it's, I think it's so, there's two things that are significant about the fact that he's talking to a whale head, right? You might ask, okay, well, that's fine. He's got this riddle and the whale has witnessed all these good and evil events and as if the whale's kind of seen into the mystery of things. Number one, Ahab is, uh, the whole novel is premised on that we need to understand the book of Job. In Job chapter 41, and just we'll take a step back here to re refresh our Old Testament. Uh, and I always tell my <laughs> students they they probably don't even remember these, but I remember cargo pants. And, yeah. And right, there's nothing wrong with cargo. No, pants. No, I actually think they're terrifically useful. <laughs> and if we had cargo pants that had enough pockets, we could carry around all the books that we need to carry to understand the great books. And so I say, well, you got to have your Homer and your Virgil and your Dante and your King James and right the Oxford English Dictionary if you can fit it in there. So. Job chapter 41, right? We remember Job has asked a very similar question. God, why is this stuff all happened to me? And God's answer is not, well, here I'll explain like why in my providence this was working out for the good. God's answer to Job is, who are you to question me? Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? And one of the things God says to Job is in chapter 41, he says, have you ever seen my, my creature, the Leviathan? You totally can't handle that creature there's no way you could touch that creature. He's so powerful. And, and Melville, you know, scripture scholars would disagree, I think, but Melville says that the Leviathan is the sperm whale. Hmm. So he's drawing on that episode in the King James. And, and God says, can you, can you fish him up with a hook? Can you fill his head with spears? Can you divide him up and sell him at the marketplace? Can you make a banquet of him? Well, Ahab is a whaling captain. He's about that business. Whereas Job says, you know what, God, you're right, actually. I can't even handle your, your creatures, much much less you and your, your ways. Ahab looks at that, you know, that story in Job and says, yes, mm -hmm. I can do those things. Yeah, in fact, I'm going to devote myself to doing these things that are a kind of rebellion against God, a kind of assertion that, yes, I can contend with the ways of the Almighty. So that's that's why he's talking to a whale head is because of that association with Job. But I also think the second thing is very important, that it's a dead whale head. Mm -hmm. It's an object that cannot answer him. And and you people people make this argument about Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, that Poe spends all has his narrator spend all this time talking to a raven that can only say one word. But then he persists in asking the raven questions to which he knows the one word the raven can answer and right. they're going to cause him pain. Will I ever see my beloved again? Never more. Will, will we be reunited in the next life? Never more. And so there's this kind of self-torturing act. For Ahab, I think there's a way in which he is deliberately asking a thing that cannot answer him. Perhaps as if uh, you could take it different ways. Number one, that Ahab thinks he's not going to get an answer. Or perhaps Ahab doesn't really want an answer to this question, to mm -hmm. the problem of pain. And as you follow the novel... Ahab actually rejects a number of moments that might partly answer this riddle of the Sphinx. It's a tragedy, right? It's right. ultimately a tragedy that he he's not able to uh, to see dimly the answer to, to one of our deepest questions. Dr. Kelly Scott Franklin, Associate Professor of English at Hillsdale College, and the great moments in the great books, Moby Dick and the Sphinx. Dr. Franklin, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thanks for having me. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Adam Carrington from Hillsdale's Politics Department, Jerry Dunleavy, and James Hassan, their new book, Cobble, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. And Kelly Scott Franklin from Hillsdale's English Department. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station, 
You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.